All right, so we are in the third uh, topic of our justice series podcast, of our, our Peacemaker podcast. We've been doing different justice topics. We've covered justice for the unborn. We've covered justice for victims of sex trafficking. And now we are uh, going to tackle justice for the foreigner. Um, and, and we're going to look at it from multiple angles, uh, refugee, immigrants, illegal immigrants, um, why that's a justice issue, um, and, and then just some of, the, some of the questions that many of us have around it. Our um, primary guest for the first two episodes of this topic are, is Matt Sorens. Matt Sorens works for World Relief. He is the U.S. Director of Church Mobilization and Advocacy for World Relief. And um, we were able to secure him. I heard a presentation that he did for our district of the Metro, the Metro District of the Christian and Missionary Alliance. I heard his presentation. I thought it was um, extremely well done and thought provoking. I sent it off to Tom Sargent, who said, yep, let's get him. And uh, so here we are. It was uh, easier than I thought it would be. Matt was so gracious to, to agree to do this. And um, we are jumping into it. Um, so I'm, I, I'm just going to, without any further delay, I'm going to hand it off to Tom, and then he'll walk us through the first, the first episode here. All right. Thank you, Chris. And thanks again, uh, Matt, for being willing to join us and, and help us uh, communicate um, about these justice issues with our church and, and, and any of the people who may be hearing it. Now, what we're going to do, uh, as we like to do at the beginning of all our justice series, um, we like to try to gather the facts and get an idea of what's actually going on with the topic at hand. <clears throat> so to do that, um, what we're going to do is have Matt share some information with you that he shared with uh, members of our district before, just so we can kind of get an idea um, of what we're dealing with and, and, and what are the, the facts and the, and the issues around the topic. So uh, with that, Matt, if you can feel free to share your screen and um, uh, take it away. <clears throat> Um, it's great to be with you guys, at least virtually, and anyone who's listening. Um, yeah, so the I want to talk about thinking biblically about immigration, refugees, and asylum seekers. And I think it's important to start there because um, so often conversations around immigration, refugees in our society are political issues or are economic issues or security issues, and all those things are important. But sometimes even in the church, we never get around to talking about what the Bible says in those topics. It's merely a, a you know, a discussion around um, different perspectives um, from kind of a social perspective or political perspective. Um, and we know that that's true because uh, we actually have polling on this. A few years ago for World Relief, we're um, the humanitarian arm of the National Association of Evangelicals. So we've been working around refugee issues actually since the late 1970s, and it was actually a Christian Missionary Alliance missionary couple who started our refugee resettlement program in the 70s out of Nyack, New York. And so since that time, we've been involved in serving refugees and then other immigrants of, of various varieties. And it's never been about, uh, you know, a controversial political issue for us. But in the last few years, obviously, um, we're aware that these issues have become increasingly uh, politicized. And we really began to wonder, because our mission at World Relief isn't just to resettle refugees, it's to empower the church to serve the most vulnerable. Well, we really wondered, well, what's the church thinking about this? What is influencing their views on, on issues of refugees and migration? So we, we conducted a poll uh, where we actually hired Lifeway Research, which is a Christian polling firm, to conduct the poll and ask self-described evangelical Christians um, of all ethnic backgrounds, what is the most important factor influencing your views on immigration? And the results were actually kind of troubling. Um, we found that a whopping 12% of evangelical Christians in the United States said that their views on the arrival of immigrants to their community were primarily informed by the Bible. And the researchers who helped us you know, shape this survey question, they warned us up front, when you ask evangelical Christians a question and one of the answers is the Bible, they will all select that, no matter what the question is. Like that, they're like conditioned that the right answer is the Bible, even if it's not totally true. Still, only twelve percent of evangelical Christians manage to say the primary influence on my views on the arrival of immigrants to my community is the Bible. In fact, the Bible, the local church, and the views of national Christian leaders; those categories combined were selected less often than the media. So, very often, we've thought about this from the perspective of name your favorite cable news channel, you know, Fox News or MSNBC or CNN, or maybe something on social media. 
but too rarely have we thought about this as a biblical issue. So I'm going to get into some of the facts here, but I also want to really just focus on what does the Bible say and how does that, how can we look at the facts and more importantly at the people at the center of these discussions through the lens of the scriptures. And we'll, we can start with this reality that for those of us who are followers of Jesus, we are followers of a refugee or maybe an asylum seeker. And I'll, I'll note the distinction in a moment. But I have a picture here of a nativity set. This is actually a nativity set that my wife and I got as a wedding present, I'm pretty sure. And a, a few years back, it just became my daughter Zipporah's favorite toy for the whole month of December. You know, we took this out from the basement and Zippy, who has, we've read her the, the, the storybook Bible enough that she knows the Christmas story, would just rehearse that story with these little wooden figurines. And, you know, it's kind of cute. It's got animals and wise men and shepherds and angel and a baby. But she turned to me one day and said, Dad, our nativity set is missing someone. We don't have the mean king. And I knew exactly who she was talking about, uh, the angry king in our storybook Bible, King, uh, king Herod, of course. And it got me thinking, you know, I've never seen a nativity set with a King Herod figurine. It's not really our favorite part of the, the nativity story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Still, it's actually a really important part of the story. And in Matthew 2, as soon as the, the wise men are on their way back to their country, Joseph is warned in a dream that Herod is coming to kill all the little boys in Bethlehem. And he, Joseph is told to get up in the middle of the night to take Mary and Joseph and escape to Egypt, crossing a border outside of Herod's dominion where they would be safe. And in that sense, Jesus is a, a refugee. Um, of course, they didn't have a formal legal definition for that term at Jesus's time, but we do now under with US law and international law. A refugee is someone who has fled their country because of a well-founded fear of persecution that has to be on account of one's race, religion, political opinion, national origin, or social group. And I mentioned that, well, maybe Jesus was an asylum seeker. The distinction under US law is an asylum seeker, uh, whereas a refugee is identified by the US government overseas and then invited to come to the United States in, in limited cases. Uh, an asylum seeker is someone who is not actually invited to the United States. They make their own way here, whether on a temporary visa, a tourist visa, a student visa, or they can get to the border. And once they're here, they have the right under US law to say, I actually meet the definition of a refugee. I have a credible fear of persecution if you send me back. So please let me stay. And I say that we don't know which one is quite the right descriptor for Jesus because, well, frankly, in Matthew 2, we don't get a lot of details about how Jesus, Mary and Joseph were treated when they got to Egypt. We don't know uh, precisely what, what the situation there was. It's very possible that there was people who welcomed them, who had compassion on them. It's also quite possible that there was people who were suspicious of them. You know, they may have heard something like, how do we know that you're fleeing from Herod and not spies sent by him? Or, you know what, Joseph, we've got enough carpenters in this economy without you stealing a job. That's the speculation. We don't know that from the text. But what is not speculation is that for the roughly 26 million people in our world today who are refugees, uh, who have been forced to flee their homes because of persecution, they have someone in Jesus who can very personally identify with that plight because it was his lived experience as a small child. Another core biblical theme is the idea that every human being is made in the image of God. And we find that in the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter one, where we're told that God made both man and woman in his image. And Christians have historically understood that to mean that human beings have an, a unique dignity. Uh, that means human life is worth protecting. Um, I imagine that came up when you're talking about the justice for the unborn. It's the same underlying principle that human life is worth protecting, regardless of any qualifier, regardless of whether you're born or unborn or your country of origin or your religion or your ethnicity or any other factor. If you're a human person, your life has value. And that, as Christians, gives us an imperative to do everything we reasonably could to offer refuge to those who are fleeing from persecution, from the risk of, of harm or even death. But then one other dynamic to being made in the image of God that I think is relevant here is the fact that people are made in the image of a creator God also means that we have potential to create and to contribute. And that's not just true of immigrants, of course, but it is true of immigrants. And I think sometimes when we talk about immigrants, we forget that dynamic because we tend to focus very quickly on, well, what are those people going to take? What, is it, what are they going to consume? Well, how many jobs are they going to take? Which are fair questions, but they're only fair questions if we're concurrently asking the question of, well, what are they going to contribute? How many jobs might they create? And the interesting thing is on an economic level, and of course there's other ways that immigrants contribute, 
but just on an economic level, the consensus of the vast majority of economists is that immigrants contribute more than they take. Uh, they, for example, um, uh, they have been responsible for creating 44% of the Fortune 500 companies in this country. I should say immigrants are their children. So all sorts of huge American companies that employ hundreds of thousands of Americans wouldn't be American companies, might not be companies at all if it wasn't for our country's history of immigration. Or even just on a, on a fiscal level, you know, if you look at refugees in particular. So again, this is a subcategory of immigrants who have been defined by the persecution that they fled and were identified abroad by the US government. Those individuals actually get some help from the US government when they first arrive. So there are some costs involved, but um, there also are some contributions involved. And while in the short term, they may cost more than they contribute, by 20 years after arrival, the average refugee adult has contributed on average $21,000 more in taxes, combined costs of governmental expenditures on their behalf. And that's from, an economist, from a study from some economists at University of Notre Dame in Indiana. But I say that not to say that we should value immigrants because of how much they contribute. Uh, we should value them because they're people made in the image of God with inherent dignity. But it is precisely because they're made in the image of God that they also can contribute. And we shouldn't forget that. We shouldn't do cost analyses, but instead do that cost benefit analysis. And when we do so, we find that um, on the net, the economists are almost universally agreed that the net economic impact of immigration is positive for the United States. As, as you're saying these things, I'm sure there are people who have heard, you know, somewhat the opposite, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> have heard mostly about the costs of, I would say specifically illegal immigration, uh, generally is where the, those costs come in and not weighing the overall cost of all immigrants and refugees across the spectrum. And, you know, there are analyses that do show a net cost uh, of illegal immigration, including from the Congressional Budget Office, uh, as far as um, net cost to state and local governments versus, and they're saying that basically there's no way to estimate the federal cost, really. So for people who are, you know, watching and uh, saying, hey, you know, I've, I've seen, I've seen, you know, data on this that shows that they actually are, are net cost aren't contributing as much in taxes as the services paid out for them. Sort of how do you, how do you reconcile that? I mean, yeah, I, I, yeah. Can, I have some stats on that if you want, but I'm, I'm sure you've seen those sorts yeah. of things. So the distinction that you made is really important. It's at the state and local level versus at the federal level. So it turns out the vast majority of taxes that get paid in, and this actually ends up being true for most people, not just immigrants, but especially for immigrants, are at the federal level, whereas most of the costs are, are at the state and local level. And there's a disconnect there. Now, one of the ways our, our federal government deals with that is they pass money onto the states. And that can be unfair when they're passing on based on the number of citizens, which in some cases they may be doing. Um, and some states bear a higher share of people who are, who are immigrants. Um, but most of the studies that I've seen have found that at the state and local level it is often a net cost, but then at the federal level, it's a net contribution. So again, those social security contributions, that's all going to the federal government. Um, and the way that works, by the way, is, I mean, it's probably not obvious. I mean, I should say the Social Security Administration, this is their data. It's coming from the chief actuary of the Social Security Administration, Stephen Goss. Um, you know, he'll acknowledge about half of immigrants who are here unlawfully are being paid in cash under the table. So they don't have that Social Security taken out. But about half by their estimates do. And the way that works is basically people have a fake Social Security card, which, you know, if you've ever looked at your Social Security card, it looks like it was made with a blue construction paper and a typewriter. Like we could probably come up with a more secure document in 2021 if we wanted to make sure that no one was working without authorization. But the reality is there's some employers who know that they're employing people without authorization. There's others who don't know that. Maybe some who don't want to know that because they just need good workers who can fill their labor needs. Again, that's not necessarily trying to exploit them, although occasionally there's that dynamic as well. Um, and again, the Social Security Administration's estimates are it's about $12 billion per year the federal level, just in social security contributions um, from individuals who, whose names don't match the number on the card. And what's interesting to me is, th and maybe obvious, they don't send that money back. They don't send it back to the employer and say, clearly this person you, you know, isn't checking out here. They send that money on to my parents and other people who are, you know, have worked and deserve their social security payment. Um, but the, it, it is right that there's, um, and it does vary from one state to another, but on the overall, if you look at all 50 states, um, the costs are probably greater at the state and local level. Uh, it's interesting, that's true for most US citizens as well. Uh, that's not necessarily a unique dynamic to immigrants. Um, but the contributions then are greater at the federal level. And those are great, great questions. And I mean, I'm happy to do more questions as we go too. So feel free to interrupt. Um, yeah, yeah, we, we probably will after this. 
uh, <laughs> present these things. <laughs> we, we'll definitely we'll definitely dig in. Um, so, I mean, the next biblical theme uh, is on the idea that you know God has this particular concern for the vulnerable, and we see that in passage after passage in the Old Testament. Um, often, actually, it's there's specific groups of people who are mentioned as being uniquely vulnerable. It's the orphan, the widow, and the foreigner. And um, if you think about it, in an agrarian society, those people were, were vulnerable because your access to food, to sustenance, was tied to the land. And if you were in those categories of people, you were unlikely to be a landowner. But God put in, not only tells his people repeatedly, I love these people, you shall love them. That's basically Deuteronomy 10, verse 18 uh, and 19. It also is he puts in place laws to ensure that the needs of these vulnerable groups of people could be met. So he tells the people of Israel, you should go through your crops uh, one time and leave what remains for the orphan, the widow, and the foreigner. So they could go out and glean, which if you think about the story of Ruth a little later on in the Old Testament, you know, she shows up as a foreigner into the land of Israel and a widow, and she goes to glean in Boaz's field, which if you don't have the background might seem a little weird. There's a few things in that story that might seem a little weird if you're just reading it for the first time. Um, but with some context, you realize, oh, she's doing what she was basically entitled to as a foreigner, as a widow. Maybe she got some good advice from her mother-in-law, who knows how things work in Israel. Uh, but it was really a, a rather ingenious system that was designed to, by God to ensure that the needs of these vulnerable groups of people could be met. Uh, not in a handout system. They still had to do some work. But there was a means by which their most basic need for food could be provided. Um, Another biblical theme there is that we're called to love our neighbors as ourselves. And we find that in Leviticus 19, verse 18. Um, and then it's interesting, even in Leviticus 19, a few verses later, if you keep going in verses 33 and 34, it says, when foreigners reside with you in your land, you shall not mistreat them. The foreigners residing among you shall be to you as your native born. You shall love them as yourselves, for you were foreigners in the land of Egypt. Um, so even if we just had Leviticus 19 to work from, we could conclude that that command to love is to be defined broadly. But Jesus then underscores that with the, uh, in the Gospels when he's asked, well, what's the greatest commandment? And of course, he says it's to love God and love your neighbors yourself. And then the, the lawyer, the legal scholar who's asking him this question has a follow-up question. Okay, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus replies not with a precise legal definition, but with a story, what we think of as the, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And we're all familiar with that story, this presumably Jewish person beaten up on the side of the road to Jericho, a priest and a Levite come by, see him in need, pass by on the other side. But then a Samaritan, someone who is ethnically and religiously different, sees him in need, has compassion on him, and takes him to get help. And Jesus says to go and do likewise, emulate that Samaritan. And I think it's important to know, you know, one takeaway for us is that neighbor whom we're called to love, we can't just narrowly define to people who are just like us, or maybe who live just near us. Another important theme there is there's not a caveat to that command, love your neighbors yourself. It doesn't say love your neighbors yourself as long as it's completely safe. Uh, the reality is it wasn't completely safe for the Samaritan in that story to stop and linger along the side of this road with a refu reputation for being a, a dangerous road. Um, from a human perspective, we might think it would be kind of prudent to actually not go down that road. Um, or if you have to be on it, to do what the priest and Levite did and don't stop and linger. But the hero of the story is the Samaritan who does stop, who puts himself at some risk to care for someone who's in need. And that actually reminds me a lot of some of the churches that we work with at World Relief and in different parts of the world that we've worked with in the Middle East or in, in parts of Africa who are receiving really large numbers of, of refugees, of displaced people coming across the border, usually not after undergoing a thorough vetting process. And they're not doing so because they're confident in how safe it is but really because they never went under the impression that following Jesus was necessarily going to be safe. And I, I think that really challenges me as an American Christian, because ironically, in the US context, we have a very different context than those churches in the, in the Middle East, for example. Uh, the refugee resettlement program is actually about the safest way you could welcome a foreign born neighbor. Uh, the refugees, and this is from um, a report from the Heritage Foundation, they and others have affirmed that the refugee resettlement vetting process is actually the most thorough vetting that the US government has for any category of visitor or immigrant who would come into the United States. Uh, it usually involves somewhere around 18 months to three years to complete. And it is, it's is—it's been remarkably successful. Um, we've had about 3 million refugees resettled to the United States since 1980. And not a single one of them has taken the life of an American citizen in a terrorist attack. And that's not to say they're all perfect people or that nothing bad could ever happen. Uh, 
Um, but it is to say the government has actually done a pretty remarkable job of what is their job, which is ensuring the security of those who are coming in. And my worry is sometimes as the church, we've been so focused on asking if the government's doing their job that we forgot to do our job, which is to ask the question, who is my neighbor? And to be the people there at the airport to welcome people as they arrive and help them to integrate into a new community. Now that's in reference to refugees in particular. And as I said, refugees come in through this vetting process with the US government. They come at the invitation of the US government. But um, when we talk about immigration, I think a lot of people, we already started talking about this with sort of the economic questions, a lot of people would quickly go to, well, what about immigrants who are not here legally? And that's, I think, a unique tension point for a lot of Christians. Uh, refugees are one thing or other immigrants who have legal status, but what about someone who uh, violates the law to either come into the country or comes in on a temporary visa and overstays? That's actually about half of the immigrants who are unlawfully in the country came in like legally, but didn't go back when they were supposed to. And for a lot of Christians, the passage that's relevant here is Romans chapter 13 where the Apostle Paul says that everyone must be subject to the governing authorities. The authorities that exist have been established by God. It goes on to say that the government does not bear the sword without reason. And so for a lot of Christians, the tension point there is, well, should we love and welcome people and share the gospel with people, or should we follow the law? And I, I think it's a, it's a false dilemma, because actually there's nothing in the law that would re restrict us from loving and welcoming people and sharing the gospel with them and, and befriending them. Um, the reality is the immigration laws are very complex. The Immigration Nationality Act is a book like this thick. It's bigger than your Bible and far less interesting. Um, but it doesn't actually have all that much to say to a church or to US citizens. Um, mm -hmm. The one area where you know an institution could get into trouble is by employing someone. So if you're hiring someone and they're not authorized to work, that's against the law. Right. But in terms of um, giving people, you know, having people come to a, a food pantry or a clothes closet or teaching people English or sharing the gospel with them or serving them communion, any of those things, there's not a reason under the law that you can't do that. There's no requirement under U.S. law that you are required to report someone who you suspect may not be lawfully in the country. So, Matt, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop you. Yeah. Uh, but I'm, I'm not looking for you to answer this. I mean, I'm just putting it out there for mostly for Tom's sake, for whenever he feels like it's, it's worth diving into. But here's a question that many, maybe some people who are listening have in their heads, if they're like me. Um, th that's, that's, that's news to me that uh, it's not required by law to report them. Not, not that I thought it was, I just didn't think about it, you know. Um, however, one, one argument um, might be that, okay, it's not illegal, but it's still unbiblical to not, sub to, to not be submissive to governing laws. So the church is called to confront sin. And then how do you do that? You know, and, 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 you know, so that's something I'd like to just circle back to at some point. How do you love while also if somebody feels like it's a sin to, to not be submissive to the laws of the land? Uh, you know, how, how do you con confront that if, if you see that as a sin issue? I'm not saying that I necessarily do, but we'll, we'll talk about that at another time. I just wanted to acknowledge what some listeners might yeah. be feeling no i th i mean if you don't mind i'd love to address that right now because i think it's a it's a it's a really good question and one that frankly a lot of pastors especially in immigrant communities wrestle with uh, and a lot of immigrants who are not here legally in those congregations wrestle with i think you know it's important to know that when we talk about undocumented immigrants it's a population that mostly identifies as christian a, a lot of these folks are in evangelical churches every sunday um obviously many others are catholic um but these are people who read Romans 13 and says, be subject to the governing authorities. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Um, I always go back to this one particular conversation I had on this very topic with a, a neighbor. He's a Baptist. He came to the United States probably 30 years ago. Um, so he'd been here a long time. He was not a Christian when he got here. Came at a point of just economic desperation, feeling like he couldn't provide for his family in Southern Mexico. Um, he didn't qualify to come legally. And I think that's important to know because it's a nice, it sounds nice to guys, we'll just come the legal way. The reality is our immigration legal system does not work the way that it did 100, 100 years ago. And it would be just about 100 years ago that we first started putting very serious restrictions on who could immigrate to the United States. Um, in fact, when my ancestors came here in the 1850s, they came here legally because they couldn't have come here illegally if they wanted to. We had no federal restrictions on immigration policy at that point. Uh, in terms of who could come at least. So uh, that's not to say that we should go back to that. I'm not an advocate for going back to that, but I do think it's important to understand that 
people are playing a very, it's, it's a much more difficult process now than it was when many of our ancestors came to the country. Um, and in some ways it's, it's a better process than it was between 1920s and 1965 for a lot of people. It has opened up in some ways as well. But for this particular gentleman in my neighborhood, you know, he was not a Christian when he got here. He comes here, someone tells him about Jesus. He hears the gospel, he transforms his life. At some point, he, you know, gets really deep into the Bible. He reads Romans chapter 13 and other passages, uh, um, you know, honor the fear God, honor the king. And he's wrestling with what that means. So, of course, his first step is, well, I need to talk to a lawyer and talk to legal counselors at World Relief. And how do I make this right? And unfortunately for him, I mean, we had our, our legal counselors would ask him 100 invasive questions to determine if he qualifies. And he doesn't. And that's basically, do you have the right family sponsor? You know, are you, are you married to a U.S. citizen? Even that doesn't necessarily solve your problem, but maybe. Um, are, do you have an employer who could sponsor you? And are you highly skilled with a master's degree? Because if not, the employer sponsor is probably not an option. And by the way, if you're already here, it's also probably not an option. But maybe if you hadn't come in this way in the first place, that might have been an option if you had a master's degree or high level education. Are you a refugee fleeing persecution? Well, in his case, he's fleeing poverty. That's not persecution. The other option for some people would be the diversity visa lottery. So it's an online lottery. The odds of winning are in a normal year somewhere on one in 400, but you can't enter if you're from Mexico or India, China, South Korea, El Salvador, Canada, the United Kingdom, any of the countries that already send the most immigrants to the United States. So for someone in his circumstance, which is a fairly typical circumstance, we basically had to tell him, sorry, you don't have any options. It's not a matter of waiting your turn in line. You can go back to Mexico. That's definitely an option. You can't come back the legal way. Not in one year, not in five years, not in 10 years. Doesn't matter how much money you want to pay an attorney. Um, it's not a matter of having the right legal counsel. It's a matter of the law itself. And so that is the dilemma he's weighing. And it's complicated, right? Because on the one hand, he wants to follow the law. On the other hand, he's married and his wife, who's also a believer, but maybe not feeling the same level of conviction on this that he is. And he wants to keep his marriage together. He's got kids who were born in the United States who, frankly, if he's going to go back to Mexico, his kids would rather go move in with their cousins or, you know, high schoolers at this point and finish their education and go on to college in the only language they've ever been educated in. And even biblically, he'd point to a passage like in First Timothy, where it says that if anyone does not provide for his uh, relatives and especially his immediate family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So he's wrestling with that as well. He came here even as a non-believer out of this sense that as a father, he needed to provide for his family. Now, I'm not going to tell you for sure the answer to that question, like what should he do? Because I do think that there are even more extreme cases than that. There are people who would be going back to literal persecution and, you know, would be killed in some, you know, fairly rare, but real cases. What I would love to be able to tell him is here's what you need to do to make this right. And I think there's a lot of pastors in that circumstance, not an amnesty. You know, here's where you go get this all forgiven and forgotten, but here's where you can go undergo a background check, fill out the right forms, pay a fine. So there's a restitution that could be made for the violation of an immigration law, which in my mind is both a way to honor the law, but also a penalty for that violation of law that recognizes that there wasn't malice involved in this violation of law. It wasn't done. I mean, there are people who would come in the United States to do harm. That's relatively rare. The vast majority of people are coming in to provide for their families, to get away from a bad situation. And the fact that most of them have been here for 10 to 20 years and and you know, are not committing crimes disproportionately is, is evidence of that, but that's not their purpose for the most part. Uh, so that's what we've called for at World Relief for a number of years is to say there ought to be a way that people could come forward, make a restitution for their violation of law and earn the chance to become permanent legal, legal uh, residents and eventually citizens if they wanna go through the normal naturalization process. We think that both honors the law while also keeps families together and is, and is compassionate. Um, and I should say, we've endorsed that with, um, you know, a lot of evangelical leaders, um, including the National Association of Evangelicals, through something called the Evangelical Immigration Table, that we really think it's a good middle way to honor the law, but also keep families together. That's, that's helpful. I mean, that's, that's good stuff. That's good. That's good stuff to wrestle with. That, 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 it, 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 well, it's helpful to have a picture in your mind of, okay, this is not so simple and clear cut. I, I especially like how you highlighted the um, <clears throat> the tension between, you, you know, honor the law, but uh, I'm commanded in scripture to, to care for my family and to be a father and to be a husband, um, you know, in, in some cases, and that's what they're wrestling with. And uh, that's helpful. So thank you. Yeah. Well, and I, to go back to the church's role, 
I worry that sometimes the church uses Romans 13 as a sort of out for not doing the part that we're called to in terms of loving and welcoming and sharing the gospel with people. Sure. Because the law didn't require that of us. I, and, and the law shouldn't require that of us. If they do, I think it's a big religious liberty concern for yeah. the state to ever tell the church you're not allowed to minister to this category of person. Right. Um, and that could happen. Laws change. There's been proposals along that line, but never any that have been passed into law. Mm. Um, I w did want to mention in terms of, this kind of goes back to refugees, so it affects some immigrants who aren't refugees as well, or at least not formally refugees, which is around the idea of persecution. And specifically that, you know, when we, if you go back to that legal definition of a refugee, it's someone who has fled persecution on account of their race, religion, political opinion, national origin, or social group. Well, a lot of the refugees who are settled to the United States are actually people who have fled persecution on account of their religion. And the religion that probably gets more people in our world in trouble today than any other is actually Christianity. So a very significant share of refugees to the United States are refugees who were persecuted, particularly because of their Christian faith. Um, probably the largest example of that in the last decade is uh, the majority of the, the Bur Burmese refugees who've been resettled to the US. In fact, the Burmese are the largest refugee group to have been resettled in the last decade. And about 70% of them are Christians of one background or another, um, largely Baptists and Anglican, some Catholic. Um, and their, their faith in Jesus is a significant factor in the persecution that they've experienced from the Burmese government. So, and there's other groups as well, about 30% of Iraqi refugees were settled in the United States or of a traditional Christian uh, background. Um, Iranians as well, the majority of Iranian refugees were settled to the US have been Christians in recent years. And actually, the, almost all the rest have been other religious minorities, um, uh, of Jews or Zoroastrians or, or others. Um, but, you know, specifically when we're talking about persecuted Christians, I think it's really important to think, you know, we want to do everything we can to help people stay safe where they're at. But if they make the decision that they have to leave, it's a unique privilege to welcome them. And in, in a sense, when Jesus says in Matthew 25, that, that by welcoming them, we could be welcoming him. He says, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. And the disciples say, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or sick or in prison or a stranger? And Jesus says, whatever you did for one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you did it unto me. Um, I think it's also important to know that when we restrict refugee resettlement as a nation, which the U.S. has done in the last few years, that's had an impact on re refugees of all religious backgrounds, including those persecuted for their Christian faith. So this data is from a report from Open Doors USA that, uh, that we did with World Relief last year. Um, so this is data through the midterm of 2020. We haven't been able to update it, but it has probably frankly continued to go down, including under the new president. Um, but you can see this is just Christian refugees of any Christian tradition from the 50 countries on the Open Doors USA World Watch List. So it went down really dramatically from about 18,000, 18,500 as recently as 2015 down to uh, last year, um, halfway through the year, it was at 950. We didn't, we didn't end up doubling that in the rest of the year. So it was more than a 90% decline in the number of persecuted Christians from those particular countries. And again, that has continued to decline into 2021 as well, even below 2020 levels. Hmm, wow. Um, the flip side of a lot of refugees being Christians, of course, is there are a significant number of refugees who are not Christians. The plurality of refugees who settled in the United States are Christians, that is to say more than any other single religious tradition. Um, but you do have a significant number who are Muslims, who are Hindus, who are Buddhists. And I think if we're honest, for a lot of Christians, that's, that's another sort of tension point. If it was all persecuted Christians, we might see higher levels of support for refugee resettlement. But there's a lot of Christians who feel that maybe bringing Muslims or Hindus or, or Buddhists to the United States could actually in some way threaten the United States. But our view at World Relief has always been that this is actually a, a remarkable opportunity for the church, uh, an opportunity to live out the Great Commission, to go and make disciples of all nations that is possible within our own communities. And, you know, in the metro New York City area, that's more of those opportunities than almost anywhere else in the world because of the very diverse population from all over the world. Uh, I don't think it's an accident that there are people who have come from so many different parts of the world to the United States. I think that God has a purpose in that. And we see that actually in Acts 17. It says that from one man, God made every nation of men, and he established the exact times and places where they should live. It goes on to say he did so for a purpose, that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. Uh, and I think that's just, you know, that's, of course, we should send missionaries to other parts of the world to bring the gospel, but it's hard to go to countries where there's very little religious freedom where it's illegal to change your religious tradition, to, to embrace Jesus, uh, 
it's frankly legal even to be the person trying to share the gospel. So while we try to do that, we should also, you know, we've missed something really profound if we don't notice that God and his sovereignty has brought people from various countries to our context where we are blessed with religious freedom, where we are free to share our faith and people are free to receive it or to reject it. And to be really clear, we're not talking about proselytism. We don't trick people into following Jesus. We don't say we'll serve you better if you pray this prayer. Uh, we're called to love our neighbors regardless of whether or not they would ever embrace Christianity. But the reality is when we love our neighbors well, without pretext, it's rare that sooner or later they don't ask the question of why. And we get to, as First Peter 3 says, to be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the reason, the hope that is within you. And to do so with gentleness and respect. And we've seen a great number of people from non-Christian religious traditions make the decision in this wonderful context of religious freedom to become followers of Jesus. We've even seen some of those people then ultimately go back to their own countries as far more culturally competent missionaries than, than most Americans could, could become. Um, I think it's this stat though really troubles me and this speaks to why it's so important that we, we recognize this opportunity because this isn't something that's automatic. Um, this is from the Center for the Study for Global Christianity at Gordon-Conwell. They find that among, among people of non-Christian religious traditions in North America, roughly 60% say they do not personally know a Christian. Not that they've never been to church or they've never wow. read the Bible. They don't know a Christian. And we might say, wow, there's enough churches around here. Those people should get out more. But maybe we need to put the mirror up to ourselves and say, are we getting to know our neighbors, which is usually a prerequisite to loving them very well. And in that context, looking for those opportunities. So at least this stat wouldn't be true. The people would say they know a Christian. And hopefully when they know a Christian, it would, it would elicit those questions of why do you love us so much? And we get to point people to the hope of the gospel. J.D. Payne, who's a missiologist down at Samford University in Alabama, says that something is missionally malignant whenever we're willing to make great sacrifices to travel the world to reach a people group, but are not willing to walk across the street. Mm -hmm. Last thing I wanted to say, and then I, then we can just do Q and A, um, is on. I, I always like to close with this quote from President Reagan. I think it's kind of uh, appropriate here. He says this is from his farewell address in 1989. He said, "I've thought a bit of the shining city upon a hill. In my mind, it was a tall, proud city built on rocks stronger than oceans, wind-swept, God-blessed, and teeming with people of all kinds, living in harmony and peace." And if there had to be city walls, the walls had doors, and the doors were open to anyone with the will and the heart to get here. Uh, I always found that, find that quote a little bit inspiring. I think it's a little, you know, it's not too far from the sort of immigration policy I would like to see our country embrace. But I also would like to quibble with President Reagan because he, um, elsewhere in this speech, he actually credits that phrase, the shining city upon a hill, to John Winthrop, an early, early Puritan um, colonist which John Winthrop did use that phrase, but it doesn't originate there. Obviously, any of us who know our Bibles know that the idea of a city upon a hill is from the Bible. It's from, it's the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter five. And it wasn't directed to the United States of America or to any nation state, actually. It was directed to the, the earliest disciples, to the church. And, you know, I think it's a really powerful passage that speaks to the current dynamic. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good work and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. I know for me, and I think this is true for all of my colleagues at World Relief, our real prayer is that the church, as we respond to what is actually the greatest forced displacement crisis in recorded history, would be that shining city on a hill. That millions of people in need of help, and frankly, many others who are just looking on, some of whom are already followers of Jesus, but many others who are not, would see the response of professed Christians, whether in the United States or in Europe or in, um, in Jordan or every, anywhere around the world, and that they would see a response that is characterized by love and welcome and advocacy, and not by apathy or even fear or hostility. And that the result would be that they would see our good works and give glory to our Father in heaven, and that many more of them would actually be drawn to that shining light. So I'll close with that, and I'm sure we can keep going with lots of questions on this theme. Mm. Thanks, Matt. Wow, that's great. Thank you. Um, you, you can yeah, unshare the screen then. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, so thanks for sharing that uh, information with us. It's a lot to, 
to think about there. The questions that um, I had for you, and there are many that we could go over, but one thing uh, that we do like to define here, not only define the facts around the problem, but uh, the whole concept of the foreigner is a broader problem than I think we have addressed before. Our, our previous podcasts have been um, more problem focused, I'd say, or more of a focused problem, such as abortion, where the injustice there is clear to the life of the unborn, or sex trafficking, where the pra very practice of it is you know, clearly an injustice. But immigration involves you know, both legal immigration, refugee resettlement, asylum seekers, and then illegal immigration. And the I think the attitudes and the opinions on that vary across those groups. Um, so it becomes a little bit unclear of what the exact injustice is. So I mean, if we could look at you know, some of the, the basic facts around it, I'm just gonna share my screen with you guys for a second, just to show a couple of things here real quick. All right, if I could share that and you guys should be able to to see that right and then so if we're if we're looking um at justice for the foreigner and sort of looking at it from a standpoint of our immigration you know what we do in our country um these are just some of the bible verses and you touched on some of those so i'm going to skip past those but in the u.s um we we allow more immigrants than any other country in the world like by by a good deal you know we have 46 million was the estimate in 2015. I believe that's up a bit. Uh, so meaning about one, one in five migrants all over the world live in the U.S. Right? And our, our immigrant population is nearly four times that of second place, which is Germany. So it, it's, you know, we do have a lot of immigration into our country. It's not as though it's clear black and white, like we're not letting anybody in ever. All right, and we allow about a million immigrants uh, to become lawful permanent residents each year, which is also more than any other country. Again, Germany, I believe, is second on that list <clears throat> as well. So about one in seven people living in our country were born in other countries. And as you had mentioned before, we've uh, resettled more refugees, about three million since 1980, um, uh, into the U.S. So um, the I'm going to stop sharing now, but the question then becomes, since we are a country that does allow a lot of immigration, how do we define the injustice to the foreigner? How, what is the actual injustice as you see it? And Matt, if you could expand upon that, help us define the actual injustice being committed or. Um, yeah, it's a great <clears throat> question. And I think the challenge is there's not one experience of the, you know, with the, the millions of people you mentioned. And I mean, there's, the US has, as you said, more immigrants than any country in the world. I mean, some of the wealthiest people in our society are immigrants to the United States, and uh, they're probably not experiencing a great deal of injustice. They've, you know, this country's done a great deal of good to them, um, and they've often done a good deal for the country as well. But what I, I do think you see particular categories of immigrants who are uniquely vulnerable to injustice. So, for example, even looking at human trafficking, um, immigrants are disproportionately victims of sex trafficking. They are the majority of victims of labor trafficking. And often that is um, tied to the unique vulnerability of maybe just not understanding the rights that they have, maybe coming from cultures where they don't trust the police for good reasons. Um, sometimes it's tied to legal status um, where they're afraid of law enforcement. And then there's a trafficker who will exploit that and basically say, you, you have to you know, do this job for me and maybe become more indebted every day than anything that I'm paying you. Um, so that's, that's one example. I think when you look at refugees, obviously the persecution that refugees themselves have experienced um, is a form of injustice when people are being threatened for their faith or uh, because of their ethnicity. Um, a lot of the folks we see are right now coming from Congo and it's a situation of war. And it's also, it's, you know, it's worth noting roughly half of refugees in, in the world are children. So you have some very vulnerable people who are caught up in conflict um, who have often seen loved ones killed um, so they have been victims of injustice elsewhere and are at risk of be, becoming still victims of further injustice. Um, we see that with asylum seekers as well. I think of a, a friend of mine who's actually, uh, he's Honduran. Um, he came up to the U.S. to seek asylum. I think this was in 2019, if I'm not mistaken. Um, he was a youth pastor in Honduras. And basically, he was so good at his job as a youth pastor that he was drawing lots of kids out of the gangs and to Jesus and the gangs didn't like that very much. And eventually um, 
they threatened his life. He had good reason to think that they weren't kidding. And he made a really difficult decision to leave and, and leaving behind, um, because it's a dangerous journey. He left behind his wife and his kids, hoping that he could get to the U S win asylum and eventually get them here. Um, he did eventually make it to the U S after a long process. He was required to wait in Mexico a long time. He was granted asylum, um, which doesn't happen in every case. Cause it's, it's, it's a high burden of proof on the part to win an asylum case. He's still waiting to try to be reunited with his wife and kids. So it's, it's not easy at all. Um, but I think, you know, those are a few examples. It's often just injustices that occurred elsewhere and being offered hope and the opportunity to start anew in a safe place is a part of that. Um, the other area where I think we do see some injustice, and I would say this disproportionately affects those who are here unlawfully, which again, I'm not saying that that's okay or that there shouldn't be a consequence to that. But um, just the way, the same way that, I mean, it's not at the same scale as, as human, as like a labor trafficking situation, but there is exploitation in, in some employers who will basically, I mean, you have the employers who don't really want to know that their, their labor force doesn't all have work authorization. You have others who would prefer to have people in that situation. I mean, I, I worked in, lived in a neighborhood for a while where one of my neighbors, um, one day he had a new manager come over and take over the restaurant where he was working and they cut his pay from eight or nine dollars an hour which was not that robust to begin with to like two dollars an hour and his choice was to leave now he was being paid in cash under the table um and you know he, he another neighbor actually worked at a laundromat or not a laundromat a, a dry cleaner and she had legal status actually she had a green card but she was being expected to um you know if you go to the dry cleaner they have the little piece of paper on all the 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 hooks mm -hmm. she had to put those on all of them before she was allowed to clock in that was just sort of the informal policy so she's basically working extra hours without pay at a fairly low paying job and i remember telling her at the time you know the department of labor couldn't come investigate that you can file a complaint there's a process for that but she told me you know what if i complain they'll know that it's me and they'll fire me and i could tell her well the department of labor says they can't do that they might find them six months or three years from now if they actually investigate it um, but she said, you know, my husband has cancer. I'm the only person working. I can't afford to lose this job. So this is just the lot that I have to take. Um, but I do think we see that sort of um, injustice as well Ooh. in that, again, that's not necessarily unique to immigrants, but often immigrants, especially those who, uh, who, because they are unlawfully present, feel that they can't actually report something, whether that's a crime being committed against them or, or an unjust labor practice feel that they can't report that. And in the most extreme cases, that actually does meet the definition of, of labor trafficking or even sex trafficking in other cases. Um, there's a number of, uh, I mean, we could look at uh, different circumstances, but it's definitely, it's, um, it's not one story. It's so many different stories, but there are some things about being a foreigner in a different country. And I think you see this in the Old Testament as well, right? I mean, uh, that tend to make someone at a disadvantage, even just culturally and linguistically. And that's where I think the role of the church in terms of pursuing justice is coming alongside those people and offering friendship and, and advocacy. Like, well, let me go to, you know, let me go to court with you and make sure you understand what's going on. Or let me um, go with you to talk to your kid's teacher and make sure that your kid's getting the education that they're supposed to get, which, I mean, we see circumstances, frankly, where sometimes a school, well-meaning or not, presumes this is an English language learning issue and they're very slow to diagnose a learning disability whereas that might happen much more quickly with a native English speaker. Um, so there's little things like that, that I think there's a, a really important role for, for seeking justice. Um, that's not to say that every immigrant is necessarily a victim, um, but immigrants tend to be uniquely vulnerable to some forms of injustice in our context. You mentioned specifically a moment ago, the role of the church. <clears throat> so could you elaborate in what ways do you think that specifically the foreigner, the immigrant uh, population, is being alienated or excluded from the church? So, sort of where is the church not incorporating them or, or even, you know, God forbid, excluding them or, or yeah. committing injustice against them? You know, I don't think there's, you know, I'm sure this happens, but I think what's less common than explicit exclusion is like uh, the majority of the church doesn't even realize that they're there. And, uh, and even within the church, even among brothers and sisters in Christ, um, we tend to live in a fairly segregated society. So, um, you know, we go to church for the most part, there's exceptions, but overall we go to church with people who look like us and talk like us. And what that often means, I mean, we're told in first Corinthians 12, that the church is one body with many parts that one part can't say to another part, I don't need you that when one part suffers, every part should be suffering with it. 
And sometimes I think in the US context, that's not happening again, not out of like intentionality, but out of a lack of attention that uh, most American Christians just don't know the immigrants in their community. We know that there are immigrants in our community. You know, we've noticed like the, the accent of someone who works at the fast food restaurant we go to or the uh, who's mowing a lawn in our community or who's running a tech company. You know, I mean, this is again, immigrants at every level of the economic spectrum, but most people don't haven't stopped to hear those stories and to realize that a significant number of those people are already believers. Um, again, some of them, it was, they were Christians before they became refugees or immigrants. It's what led them to have to come to the United States. And we have so much, not only to offer foreigners in the United States, but we also have so much to learn from foreigners in the United States. And I think that's, that's the sadness to me is, you know, we're not just to suffer with those who suffer and mourn with those who mourn, but also to rejoice with those who rejoice. And we're missing out on a lot of joy if we're not connected to, to particular other parts of the body. And I would say the Christian Missionary Alliance as a denomination uh, is ahead of the curve in terms of a lot of evangelical denominations in terms of uh, immigrant communities. Like it's one of the more ethnically diverse denominations in the country. And a lot of that goes back to embracing Southeast Asian refugees in the 70s and 80s. And those people are still disproportionately part of Christian Missionary Alliance churches or, um, you know, just as one example. So there's also, there, there's some really positive stories there, but there's always work to do. Yeah, yeah, that's good, Matt. Very true. And um, <clears throat> I want to just ask something and, and don't take this in a confrontational manner because I just mean it to be um, more more of an academic, if you will, question. We were talking previously about the economics of immigrants and specifically illegal immigration. We were talking about the difference between federal, state, and local. And I had mentioned, you know, you had, you know, given some numbers about the positive contributions on the federal level. And there are, I'm sure you've seen, you know, you know uh, conflicting reports, say, like, so let's say, from Federation of American Immigration Reform or the Heritage Foundation um, and, and things like that showing a, a, you know, a net cost. But the, the question is, do we, is it helpful or necessary to make any economic argument for immigrants or asylum seekers? Because it, just to, as a hypothetical, is it really showing the love of Christ or are, are really compassionate to say, hey, let in a whole bunch of people who are making me money um, or, you know, exclude a bunch of people who aren't making me money. So yeah. is, is the economic argument and again, not, not confrontation. Is the economic argument worthwhile or should we focus more on the call from, from Christ? Not that they're exclusive, but... Yeah, I definitely think we should focus primarily on the call of Christ. And again, the, even the, the biblical foundation of people being made in the image of God, while I think that is part of why we have to look at both costs and benefits, because sometimes I think we naturally only look at costs, Fundamentally, even if people are drained on the economy, to use kind of derogatory language, there's still people made in the image of God whom we're called to respect and honor. Um, I, I do think for a lot of Americans, the economics is, I mean, again, this goes back to the poll I started with. I wish the Bible was enough to, to help us love and welcome immigrants. The evidence suggests it's not, because it's not how most American Christians think about this issue. They think about it as an economic or security issue. And so then I think we have to look at the complexity of the economics and the security questions. Um, it's not all good or all bad. I mean, I would say, um, like I, I was just pulling up because there's a, there's a study out of Texas in particular, and I, was, I said it was a Cato Institute, it's not, it's the Baker Institute. So former Secretary of State Baker, I believe is where the Baker comes from at Rice University. And I can, I can share this with you all. Um, but you know, they, Texas actually has more data on this than certain other states and they, they actually, you know, when they, when they calculate in all the different levels, they think even if you look just at illegal immigration in Texas, it's a net economic contribution. Um, and I can put that in the chat as well if you want to read it later or share it with folks. Um, I would say this, and, and not to be, again, not to, I completely agree with you. First and foremost, it's a biblical issue and that to be our grounding. There are groups out there, like FAIR in particular, um, that I, I think in some ways, doesn't tell the full story. If you look at some of their data, and here's an, a critique of that, of the FAIR study I just put in from the Cato Institute, they basically add up the cost without it looking at the contributions, um, which is exactly what I think we do when we forget that people are made in the image of God. And to quote Michael Gerson, who was a speechwriter for President Bush, we tend to think people are mouths 
and we forget that they're also hands and feet and brains. And we are only thinking of the, the deficits and forgetting about the contributions. In the case of FAIR in particular, if you look at the foundations of the organization, it was started uh, by a guy named John Tanton, who was, he also started a Planned Parenthood chapter in Northern Michigan out of the idea that there's just basically too many people in the United States. And his modus operandi is we need to control the population. And population growth is a problem for kind of pseudo environmental reasons. I, you know, I think we, should, we are called to take care of God's creation, but I think that they take that to kind of an extreme um, level. And that ends up being sort of the motivation behind that particular group, which is very actively advocating not for less illegal immigration, but for less immigration overall. Yeah. But I think your underlying point is very much right on that whether or not immigrants are good for the economy, it doesn't really change the reality that we're called to love and welcome them. So I would imagine, and you guys can both push back on me, um, I, I would imagine some people raise that argument of the cost benefit analysis because they see it, they see it as an injustice in the other direction. You're, you're, they're, they're, they're becoming a drain. I'm working hard for my family and they're draining the economy and they're taking jobs and, and it's not fair. And this minority group is stealing from this minority group who's been here and has been working hard and went through the legal process. Um, I, am, I, am I correct in that, that the, that the economic factors could help to argue against the argument that there is another injustice to us domestically when we in, invite all these people in? I mean, that's where I think, for example, that study from Notre Dame on refugees, because refugees are an interesting case. They actually received a lot more help from the government than any other immigrant. Like, so there are more costs than for someone who's not here legally. Um, but, and if you look at them one year after arrival, it's, you know, the costs, you can add up the costs and they're significant. And again, there have been studies that do that. They look at refugees basically shortly after arrival and add up all the costs. But if you look at my one-year-old or well, my seventh-month-old baby and look at his economic contributions, well, he's a net drain on the economy too, right? He hasn't paid a dime in taxes his whole life. But that's kind of silly, right? We don't look at children in one snapshot. We look at them over horizon. And that's what I thought this study out of Notre Dame was really helpful because it acknowledges that the longer you're here, the more you're contributing, which is sort of logical. Like if any of us was dropped overseas and didn't know the language and was trying to figure things out, it would take a little while before we would be likely to be um, you know, working and a net contributor. But it turns out on the net that that is true of refugees. So I, I think to the argument, well, we can't afford to help refugees. On the, if we have the long view, those refugees might be part of solving some of the other justice issues we have. They might be part of the tax base to make sure that homeless communities of native born US citizens um, have access to, to housing or that, um, you know, there are any number of vulnerable groups of people for whom um, some financial support could be part of, part of addressing the challenge. And again, the Vietnamese are a fantastic case study of that. Give them 30 to 40 years and the Vietnamese community, which is almost entirely made up of resettled refugees or their family members, are significantly less likely than the average American citizen to live in poverty. Um, they are, are disproportionately entrepreneurial. They've started whole industries that didn't exist before Vietnamese refugees came here, like nail salons. That didn't exist before entrepreneurial Vietnamese refugees. Um, they didn't take anyone's job painting nails. Like they created a new service that a lot of people, mostly women, appreciate. And that also creates a bunch of new jobs, even for people beyond their community. Separating a personal, your personal approach to the foreigner, to the person, from your desired policy approaches or um, your desired policies for immigration for our country. Um, can you, as a Christian, uh, do you think, can, can you reconcile um, advocating for, say, stronger border security or, or tightened uh, immigration law and still, still show, show the love of Christ or model Christ toward the foreigner uh, with, those, with those views? Yeah, I mean, what I would say is the Bible is, does not give you an immigration policy. You're not going to like read the Old Testament backwards and find secretly hidden the number of refugees that should be admitted to the United States. I think there are prudential judgments we can take from biblical principles that can give us wisdom in thinking about immigration policy, which by the way, like we've been really clear at World Relief, we think it's appropriate to have secure borders. And we think the government should take reasonable steps to ensure that no one seeking to do harm would be able to come in. That's not the same as closed borders, uh, but the, you know, they should be secure borders. Um, so, I, you know, I think that there's a nuanced approach to the policy questions, but I'm very careful not to say like, this is the Bible's immigration plan. Uh, because 
we inherently have to use prudential judgments. That's not to say the Bible cannot inform our approach to immigration policy. I think it can, and I make an argument that it should. But I also think that people can come to good faith disagreements on that. But I do think there's actually a lot less space for disagreement biblically on how you treat your immigrant neighbor. Mm. Um, it's just really hard to make the Bible say that you should um, exploit people or hate them and insult them. Like it's, you know, that's, that's going to be a harder case to make biblically, I think. Mm -hmm. So you, immigration policy is more of a prudential conversation. Like how do different biblical principles apply here? What is the role of the state that we see in Romans 13? Um, uh, but also this call to love and compassion. And what are the interests of the church as well? I mean, one reason I would be concerned about reducing immigration is it would be reducing the fastest growth in the American church. Uh, we are seeing immigrants revitalize American Christianity in a lot of ways that I think would be short-sighted for Christians to cheer that on. Um, likewise, when it's non-Christian non immigrants, we're seeing the mission field cut off to us, which, you know, the, I don't think that's in our interest to advocate for. But those are prudential judgments that we can discuss. Uh, but I do think the interpersonal question of how do you relate to your neighbor is just, a, it's even more clear. Well, thank you for that. So Matt, yeah, we'll let you go. We won't do a long outro here, but uh, just dude, thank you so much. This is, this is gonna be helpful for people. Good, well, I'm happy to do it. All right, see you then. Right. I'm just gonna pray right. us out here real quick right. and then we'll be good. Lord, we thank you for this, uh, this opportunity to come together to talk about something that's on your heart, Lord, the plight of, of the foreigner, uh, Lord, and how we, how we deal with that in our, in our country, in our lives, in our church, Lord. And I just pray that you would have our hearts line up with yours uh, in the way that you uh, have us approach uh, these issues and, and show your love to these people, Lord. And thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you all. Hopefully next week I'll be in my office and not in my basement. <laughs> All good. I'm in my basement too. So take, take care, Matt. Totally fine. Yeah. Thank you.